and welcome from the beautiful town of Ubeda, because this is where the start was earlier this afternoon for the second edition of the Clásica Jaén Pariso Interior. Uh, we're doing it um, the other way around, actually, with um, Ubeda as our start place and Baisa as our finish location. Last year it was the other way around with that very steep finale, that very steep climb heading into Ubeda. On these cobbles, they might really seem familiar. Last year, a win by Alexei Lutsenko, head of Tim Wellens, Luik Vliegen, Lena Kemna, and Connor Swift was fifth. We don't have Lutsenko on the start list, but we do have Tim Wellens and also his uh, teammate today, Pogacar, who makes his season debut today here in this rather wonderful town. Clear blue skies today, no rain, no, no, not a lot of wind actually in this town that really profited from uh, some um, patronage during the uh, late Renaissance when uh, some of the people from this town actually held high um, positions at the court of um, Charles V and his son Philip II, the Holy Roman Emperor. So a lot of money actually um, came back from the Escorial, from the uh, palace all the way back to the region here in Andalusia. We're on the border between uh, Andalusia and Castilla La Mancha, so slightly more to the northwest of where we were racing yesterday in Almeria. But a lot of racing uh, going on this week in the south of Spain, of course, on Wednesday. We continue with the Vuelta Andalusia. These are the guys from the... Um, only continental team, Electro Hyper Europa, Equipo Kern Pharma, with uh, Igor Arieta, amongst others. The lovely orange jerseys of Euskatel on the podium with uh, Luis Angel Mate. Yesterday's winning team, Q36.5, without yesterday's winner, Matteo Moschetti. We have Burgos BH, Burgos BH in Spanish, and the riders of Flanders Valoise, the new name of the team that's been going on over 30 years. We have Simon Clark there, lovely little bit of casquette action there. Caps, not hats for Simon Clark. Caja Rural, of course, also always at the start of these uh, Spanish races. We have Arkea Samsik with Varan um, Bargil, amongst others. Lots of destiny with the Dutch national champion. But without Arno de Lee, Simon Geschke there with the beard for Kofidis. And the team of last year's winner, Astana, Kazakhstan, with, uh, amongst others, uh, Fabio Fellini. The Movistar with uh, sports director Jose Vicente Garcia Costa, but behind the wheel of the team car for the first time is Alejandro Valverde. Tim Velas was the runner-up uh, yesterday, did a fantastic lead-out on, uh, on Saturday in the Clásica uh, Murcia. But of course, a lot of people were looking out for today Pogaccia, who is uh, doing things a little bit differently this year. He is uh, continuing with the Ruta del Sol and then... Um, Apparently, according to Lekip, is going to race Perry Nice for the first time and not Tireno Adriatico, a race that he won two years in a row. So, yeah, Brian and I, we discussed this uh, yesterday as well, but when we have time, we'll probably go over it again. Uh, a little bit of um, a different run up for Pogacar towards his, uh, well, hopefully for him, next sort of France crown. There is uh, Valverde, a little bit of a duvet kind of jacket probably uh, cold this morning and <laughs> then the red flag and the uh, race director the Spanish national coach uh, Montpaler is just the race director here in uh, this new race it's a 1.1 race so that's a third category race but um, after last year it already gained some notoriety and uh, many more World Tour teams have actually showed up here we have Astana, Movistar, Team Emirates, Ineos Grenadiers, Enter Mashi and uh, Team Kofidis here on the start line and of course also Israel Premier Tech and Lotto Destiny. Attacks were flying actually straight from the start and we ended up with a breakaway of five riders. I'll quickly give you the name because the situation has changed but we do want to give them a little bit of love there. Um, Camilo Ardila, the Colombian rider for Burgos Beace, Javier Miguel Asparen for Escatel, Matis Lebert for Arkea Samsic, Matthijs Pasens for Lotto Destiny, and Sergo Simitier 
for Team Movistar. And those are the two riders remaining of that breakaway of five. The man with the moustache is uh, Javier Miguel Asparen, and this is Sergo Semitier, the 27-year-old from uh, Aragon. 63.6 kilometers to go. That means that we are currently on sector number four of um, Tramo, as they call it in Spanish, but we'll just call it uh, Sterato, the uh, Italian name, or the wide roads here of the province of Jaén. My name is Jose Bain. With me today is Brian Smith. And Brian, uh, the pace is full on at the moment. Yeah, you'd expect that. And it's, it's always the case when you put you know, these kind of gravel roads in any any place at all, you know, it just keeps the speed high because, you know, everybody wants good positioning on it and, you know, everybody wants to race it from the front. So any races that, you know, have cobbles, gravel or anything like that, you know, steep climbs, it does push the pace up. And and over the last kind of couple of days, we've been commentating, you know, UAE have been prominent near the front and ever more so today because... You know, they've got debutant uh, Pogacar in the ranks. He's sitting at the last of the riders in the white and the black sleeves at the front. So, you know, he's come here, like you say, with a, a different view now. He wants to start the season uh, with um, some different racing and kind of mix it up a little bit, which I think is great. We talked about it yesterday. Um, but there's still a sizable peloton left. It's been split up, as you would expect. Some of these gravel sectors uh, split the peloton up. We did start with a sizable peloton today of 112 riders, but it looks as if we've lost quite a few of them already. Yeah, it's been it's been full on. The maximum lead of these riders was actually five and a half minutes, and then uh, Ardila, the man from Colombia, was the first one to get dropped. And yeah, in the first split that happened, uh, Team UE Emirates basically had their entire team in that first half. The only one who didn't make the split was Stuart Box, the Dutchman. Doman Novak, the uh, rider from Slovenia, didn't take the start because he, he had a fever this morning. So uh, they started with six and uh, yeah, already uh, dictating the race. They have a lot of options in this race, Brian, because it's not only Pogacar that they brought to the uh, Klassika Chaim. Yeah, I think most of them, most of these riders in this race today have ridden uh, Murcia and uh, Almeria, so there will be a little bit of fatigue. You know, we heard from uh, some of the riders yesterday after Almeria, especially uh, Jordi Mayus, uh, that he, you know, felt a little bit fatigued in, in the sprint, and you know, he was up there in in Murcia um, in the top three. So I think the same could be said about a few riders in here when, when it comes to the. The pointy end, I think they'll be feeling a little bit of that fatigue, but one person is fresh, and that's Pogacar. <laughs> uh, he didn't ride the other days, so he's here, and I think he's here to, to win this race today. Um, I believe he, you know, he's going to be riding Strada Bianchi, um, you know, and it's a, a great way of... I know it's very different, the gravel uh, in Spain, the gravel over in Italy, but it's a great way to maybe test some... You know, new tyres out, new equipment or, and on this. But I think Pogaccio, the way that you are riding today, Pogaccio wants to win this race. Yeah, he won uh, his third, well, he won on the second race day in 2020. He won on the third race day in 2021. And last year, he won on the fourth race day of the year. So, well, there's only one position left to, uh, to do on your first day of the year. And that is actually uh, win the race. And... Um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting combination racing Strada Bianca on Saturday and then going all the way up to the north of France, uh, just outside of Paris, to start the uh, eight-day stage race of Perry Nice. So, um, yeah, he wants to defend that title, of course, in Strada Bianca. Hello, there's a bit of a feeling starting by the there season. Is, How do you gotcha. feel? What's your goals for today? Yeah, I feel good. Uh, my goal is to, to feel good through the whole the race and, uh, yeah, try to, to do the best with the team. And we know we a relation with Stradivianke, it's a bit like Stradivianke like here. What are the reasons you chose this race to come back? I don't know, uh, just try something different and uh, spice up the calendar. And you already hope to win today? I don't know, I, I don't know my uh, race feelings, so uh, we will see. Uh, let's hope for the best. Just one word about the season we read this morning, that uh, you are shaking up a bit uh, your preparation. Can you tell us a bit what's the idea? What is the plan really? Well, the plan is uh, to come as best as possible to Tour de France. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, also the classic. I really want to be in good shape for uh, San Remo, Flanders, Liège and yeah, uh, Tour de France. 
Yeah, he's he's only just 24, uh, Fede Pogaccia, uh, twice winner of the Tour de France, and all these other things that he's won already. And uh, yeah, this is the start of his season. That will also include, yet again, the Tour of Flanders. Last year, he was actually not that far off. So let's see what he can do uh, this year, of course. So we're all looking forward to that. But first, there's a whole lot of racing coming up. These two riders, they're working well together. We have Asparen, the man from uh, the Basque Country, from uh, San Sebastián, and the man from uh, Aragon, which is uh, just to the south of the Basque Country. Sergio Samitier, 27, the man in blue. 23 is the man in orange. And yeah, Asparen, it's, it's a name that you find in breakaways in all these races, not only in Spain, but also in, in other races that Euskatel, Euskadi rides. Um, he and his brother are, are always represented in breakaways. They seem to make... Uh, a little bit of a, a, a competition between the two of them who can be in the most breakaways. That image we see there, uh, all the way um, at the top of your screen, that small figure is Matthijs Parsons, the uh, Dutch rider for Lotto Destiny, was also part of the breakaway but uh, got dropped. And this is uh, the man that we've all been talking about. Well surrounded by, well, basically his entire team today, Borussia. I'm happy to report the Tofts are back in business for another season, Brian. Yes, he's decided to keep a bit of length in his hair, as always. <laughs> he's, he always seems like a very happy guy. I've never seen Pogaccia frustrated. He always is, is, is happy, kind, seems very down to earth as a person as well, despite everything that he's won. I like that. He seems to be the par perfect uh, sportsman that uh, in defeat he will go up and congratulate the, the winner. He, he take everything and he doesn't take anything lying down. And, you know, I think that he's good nature, but believe me, you have to have that killer instinct when you win races. You don't win races by being a nice person. Um, so you have to have that, that killer instinct at times. And... But away from that, away from the heat of battle, uh, like you say, he's, he's that kind of perfect sportsman that always up for a laugh, very relaxed and, and enjoying himself. And that's that's the thing. That's what I I always preach to a lot of uh, youngsters is you've got to have fun. Don't put pressure on yourself. Um, and definitely Pogaccio is having fun. And, and you heard it in his interview. We were kind of speculating about it yesterday and just briefly uh, a moment ago that, you know, just spice, varieties of spice of life, and just spicing up his, his start to the year a little bit. Just keeps, you know, the mentality fresh. Not that he needs it, because I think, you know, he he's not got a huge programme. Um, it is all about the Tour de France. Sometimes in the past I haven't liked it, um, but he is he is up for trying to do something today in his first race back this year in 2023. And I think the the fact that he's looking at. Flanders, um, Milan San Remo, Liège, Tour de France. Um, you know, many in the past used to just kind of concentrate on the Tour de France. That was it was all about the Tour. But um, great to see that he's got other other uh, goals to try and hit early season. Yeah, and of course, uh, there's been a lot of talk in the uh, UAE Team Emirates headquarters after that um, defeat in the Col du Granon, uh, the defeat on the hands of Team Jumbo Visma. And uh, George Bennett gave an interview and he said, well, we're not going to be tricked again. We're not going to let that happen again. It will all be about beating Jumbo Visma this, uh, this summer on the roads of France. Well, we'll actually, we start in the Basque Country um, with the first three stages. But um, it's, it's going to be absolutely fantastic, that battle between the two super teams, Team Emirates and Team Jumbo Visma, because, uh, well, they have learned from last year, Brian, at Team Emirates, and they will not let it happen again. No, they, <laughs> you know, you, you, you always learn, uh, and you have to keep on learning as well. Um, you know, everybody should learn from the mistakes. That's the, the nature of, of sports, and nobody likes making mistakes, but everybody does. doesn't matter who you are, you always make these mistakes. And we heard it from the sprint finish yesterday that there were some mistakes made by um, Dilly, and, you know, it cost them. Yeah, there's also some news about Arnaud Delit. He's not on the start line here, um, Delit, but he has added uh, the onlook of news plots to his schedule. We already speculated about that yesterday. 
um, with the Muur van Gerardsbergen, Bosberg, Combo. I think it's about 18 or 20 kilometers out from the finish line. Absolutely no issue for Arnaud de Lee, the way that he's climbing at the moment. So, yeah, those those races are, are going to be important for his development. And we must remember he's only 20. And he's allowed to make mistakes, you know. The, the, the difficult thing is, and even with a guy like Pogacar, when he's 24, we do expect these riders to win each and every time, every race they line up. And, of course, they, they will not be winning everything. They will make mistakes. They will lose. And, uh, well, that's what makes sports nice. You know, if we already know from the start who's going to win this bike race, we'd, we'd better just not bother. These two riders are on their way to our fifth of eight sectors of unpaved roads, of gravel roads. Uh, the longest one was actually sector number four that we just finished. And this is sector number five, which is the shortest of the eight. In total, just over 53 kilometers of unpaved roads in this race that is uh, 179 kilometers long. This sector starts at 44.9 kilometers from the finish line. So we have a little bit of relief for the riders uh, before they head uh, hit the next sector. We can see that the uh, team cars here of Team Movistar um, are already quite dirty. Uh, they need some washing after today, but that is, of course, what the dry roads here in the province of Chayen do to the car. And we are racing here in the, um, well, one of the most important olive-producing regions of the world. And there he is. Well, that is uh, Jose Vicente Garcia Costa, but sitting next to him is uh, Elin Batido, Alejandro Valverde, newly retired uh, Brian, and um, first time in the team car for him. What what is what is the kind of thing that that a pro, a former pro like Valverde, could contribute to this race? What is the kind of information that he is sharing with the riders? Well, he's probably thinking along the same lines as as a rider. Um, I, I know that Valverde was a very good rider, but there's a difference being you know, in the team car and, you know, in the past we know about the kind of fallouts with some of the riders, you know, it's either, you know, Valverde's way or the highway, pretty much, and you have to, you're not on the bike anymore and you really have to, he'll be thinking, you know, that he is, he's in this race and what would he do? It's kind of interesting and I think what they're trying to do at the moment, Movistar, I think is the best thing. When you look at their team, they have got potential there of winning this race normally races like this they would be the team riding on the front they would be riding for someone they would be riding for someone like Valverde but what they've done is a little bit different I don't know if it's um, coming from the original sports directors or this is a Valverde that's di dictating this but they put someone in the breakaway someone as strong as Samitier and what that's doing Jose is forcing UAE to ride, to ride hard, and if they're riding and using up their team, then they'll be limited come the end. You can see in the group behind there is about at least three Movistar riders in there. So the best way for them to attack, they, as I said, they've got a couple of options. Um, and if you tire out the team of UAE, then it's in their best interest. So what Samitia is trying to do is to force a hard chase, before, make it as hard as possible for the the group behind and force UAE's cards, and that's what they're trying to do. They started with six, so it's, by the looks of things, Valverde's going to go on for it, made sure that UAE, one of the favourites, Pogaccio, for this race today, that he's already started with six riders, so he's got five riders to help. He's got four riders already, and just to keep that pressure on that team, well, so far, so good for the uh, tactics by Team Movistar. And uh, we're going to listen to Simon Clark now. Well, Simon, we have seen two days ago that uh, the shape was good. What kind of terrain you should like here? Yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to today. Uh, I love Strada Bianca, so Spanish Strada Bianca is also very nice for me. Uh, but it's going to be an interesting race. Being a new race, we don't really know, you know, with Strada Bianca, we know how the race unfolds and traditionally the important points, but today is a little bit of an unknown. So it will be important to race attentively because uh, the race could be decided at any moment. And uh, with uh, maybe not the world tour, full world tour field, um, that will also have an impact on the race. 
not the all the world to uh, feel, but there is Tadej Pogacar. So I make, I guess his presence makes the race a bit more predictable. Well, not? predictable, I don't know. Uh, I don't think uh, Tadej's rate, the way he races, is not pre predictable. So it's, I think the race is definitely not predictable. What is predictable is that when he uh, decides to attack, there will be a lot of pain. Uh, but definitely Ineos and and UAE are the two teams to watch today and, and we must be careful of uh, how they move. And so that means that you have to, to see how they move or you have to try to anticipate maybe? Uh, we'll see. I'll assess the situation. Uh, it's, there's very, it's very windy today so anticipating uh, I think is, is maybe not a good idea. Uh, you will use a lot of energy and you'll pay for that in the final but we will see. Just one last question. You say it's a bit like Strade Bianche. What, uh, what is special in terms of bike handling, in terms of bike itself, uh, in that kind of races? Uh, we, the, we just changed the, the tyres we race, basically. Uh, I'm actually testing some new equipment today for, for Strada Bianca, so it's a nice race. One, because it's a nice race, but two, because it's also a chance for us uh, to test our equipment for Strada Bianca. Thank you very much. Thanks, Simon. Good luck. Thanks. Yeah, talking about uh, down-to-earth and kind people. Simon Clark is, of course, one of the examples of a top professional and all in all, um, fantastic guy as well. Um, yeah, they're testing new stuff, which is um, which is interesting because uh, yeah, you don't get a lot of these opportunities to test gravel um, in races. So um, yeah, if you're ambitious for the Strada Bianca, why not put the equipment to the test? Uh, today we have 53 and a half kilometers of gravel as Samitir is um, going solo at the moment. He um, is now without his Basque companion, Javier Miquel Asparen. So uh, continuing on his own, 50 kilometers to go. We did see two of the teammates in that chasing group. Um, I recognized Izaguirre and Serrano. Yeah, what kind of tyres? Uh, judging from what I see, uh, Brian, at least a 30 millimetre tyre, might even be a 32. Yeah, ma <clears throat> maximum uh, would be 32, but I would think that most of them would be on on 30s, like you say. Um, you know, it just uh, it gives them an opportunity to kind of test out a little bit of pressure as well. But, you know, looking at it, it the riders having right, it looks compact enough uh, we've only kind of seen one sector and it, it looked actually okay. You see if it rains, it becomes soft, it comes a, a different kettle of fish altogether. Yeah. You know, any any cobbles or, or any um, kind of gravel uh, is going to change when it when it gets wet, but it looks as if it's, it's drier. You've got to remember that over the last few days we have had a, a little bit of inclement weather, um, some rain and even snow on the high ground, so... But I think predominantly it's been quite dry here. So I think it's more about the, uh, you know, the kind of pressures, the, the width of the tyres, but most of them would be about 30. The maximum you want to go on on, on this would be 32 anyway. Um, so I would say most would be on 30. They might try 32 and see how it rolls, but um, it's down to kind of the individual teams. But just looking at this ticker, you'll say 223. It's been like that for a while. I'm not too sure if that's consistent. It's moved to 225, but if it has, he's kind of increased a little bit. He's... Um, to the group, then it whacks off a few seconds, it goes to 217 very, very quickly. So he's holding on, and this kind of false flag drag up here. Um, he's holding on, some here, and um, yeah, it's into the last 50 kilometers, and now we're starting to see some action. Yeah, this uh, is uh, Matsvur Smith, the uh, rider for Israel Premier Tech, and uh, one of the riders for um, Lotto Destiny as well. Um, could actually be for Nate Felt. Um, this race has got 2,300 meters of elevation, and most of that is in the second part. Like I said before, we are racing it the other way around. So uh, last year we had the finish in Baesa with a very steep climb, um, where Lutsenko was absolutely the strongest. Now we're racing it the other way around. They made the race a little bit more open, with more gravel sectors in the latter part of the race and more meters of elevation, especially in the middle part. We just did that middle part um, of the race as, uh, as Parsons is now pacing his teammate, Parsons who dropped back from that breakaway, that original breakaway of five. 
This was about the point last year, Brian, where Lutsenko uh, placed his attack and nobody ever saw him again. But the field this year is, is of a far higher level. Of course, last year it was a new race. People were just, well, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm going to send my team. We still have a lot of racing to go. But this year we'll have a pretty, pretty solid field. So I absolutely do not expect the same scenario to happen this year. No, like you say, it was a different field altogether. Um, there was a lot of racing going on, and I don't think it was the strongest field, although, you know, the winner was very, very strong last year, and I don't think we'll see likewise this year. Yeah, of course, Lutsenko, he loves a little bit of gravel, won the uh, inaugural edition of La Serenissima Gravel in the beautiful province of Venice. And this is indeed Lennart van Eetveld, one of those young prodigies from, uh, from Belgium, also from the own development team, from Kurt van der Waal's uh, development team. And Parsons is doing everything that he still has left to, uh, to pace his young teammate. Matthijs Parsons, who is Dutch, but actually uh, grew up in Belgium. And if you hear him speak, he's got a, a pretty solid Flemish accent, uh, despite his Dutch passport. A little bit like Mathieu van der Poel as well. So these are the two chasers at the moment. We have uh, Mats Ruud Schmidt in the colors of Israel Premier Tech and Leonard van Eetveld. In the peloton, we have a large, uh, well, almost the entire team of Team Emirates, and the same goes for the Ineos Grenadiers, who have a pretty strong team here as well, with Leo Hayter, Kim Heiduk, Brendan Rivera, Luke Rowe, Ben Turner, Connor Swift, and Ben Chulet, who flew in yesterday evening uh, to do this race. It was originally not on his program for the uh, men from Kent, um, but I think he's the replacement for Michael Leonard, who, uh, who crashed in our weekend races. So yeah, Ben Schulert, of course, with his pedigree in cyclocross and uh, a good climber at it as well, is, um, is one of the riders to look out for, as is, of course, Ben Turner, uh, the winner of Saturday's Vuelta a Murcia. A little bit of a tricky part here. Luckily, uh, no upcoming traffic. But Sergo Simitia, just like you said, Brian, he is holding on, well, pretty well, two minutes still on the first chases and when he gets caught if he gets caught he, he might stay at the front what is the kind of work that he's going to do for the team the same as we just saw with Parsons um, I don't know how the will have anything left by the time he gets caught because I think he's been pushed at the moment um, he is trying as hard as he can um, this is just to keep pressure on the front of the race this is what he's doing he, you know one rider if he eases up, you would think that the, the group behind um, would ease up a little bit as well because there's no real pressure. There's still 46 kilometres to go. One rider is not going to stay out there alone. But you can see he's pushing it. He's going around his corners, trying to keep as, as much speed around his corners as much as possible. He wants to keep the pressure on the race. They want to try and kind of break um, Team UE uh, and with the fact that, you know, Pogacar might... might uh, be on his own come the, come the final and you know Movistar have got a couple of options to play we heard from Simon Clark saying that's all they can do they've got Ennis and um, UE are the, the two strongest teams here you have got both Ben's uh, Ben Tuller <laughs> lives not far away in fact I saw him just before Christmas uh, out training uh, he was stopped as I rode by and I had to wait for him. Um, I won't say that too often, but... Um, <laughs> no, you won't. Yeah, the, the race is starting to open up a little bit. Teams are starting to play the cards. Clearly, Israel Premier Tech and Lotto Destiny don't want to just sit back and have the race controlled by uh, UAE Team Emirates. Passing through the uh, town of Ibros. Some, uh, well, apparently some local school kids coming out to, uh, to cheer this man on. They had a, a pretty solid start to the season, uh, Team Movistar, with uh, wins already in, uh, in San Juan. They won uh, in Oman today. So um, they might add no another spoiler. win. No spoiler, but um, it's, not, it's not live. We don't have it, so maybe I can spoil it then. But um, the thing that I wanted to say is that they had a pretty solid start to the season. And you mentioned before then that when Valverde was still racing, it was always Valverde's way. The, the fact that he retired could also liberate the team and, and give other guys uh, more, more options to race. Yeah, he was, when, he was the kind of leader of the team that 
you know, more often than not, when he went to a race, he was on good form. Oh, um, did you see Van Edbelt just here crash? In... I just yeah. thought that a couple of the corners were a, a little bit, but they might Hot have ball. been just a little bit dust in the road as well. Um, so unfortunately. For Madsworth Smith, he doesn't have a, another strong rider with him, but we're just going round a couple of, we saw Samiti going round some of the corners and yeah, just a little bit uh, unfortunately for uh, Van Edveld. Which is, of course, also bad news for Madsworth Smith because uh, he lost his companion. He just. Uh, speeds by Asparen as well and is now 1 minute 45 according to the GPS behind our leader there we are he's on his way to the next sector um, yeah this is the one it's starting over there where the sign is and we're racing in between the uh, fields of olive trees Brian olive fruit or vegetable um, olives um... I would say vegetable. It's a fruit. It's actually the same order of fruits as an apricot, stone fruit. And the fact that due to the uh, denomination, it doesn't really matter whether it's sweet or not. It's, uh, it's a fruit and uh, it's one of the most important agricultural products from the region. 90% of olives actually go into olive oil and only 10% are for having it in your martini or on your pizza. So what do you expect for that kind of race? It's a bit special, we have a bit this of a like both. Maybe not a work to like Phil. What do you expect here? Ah, it's, a, it's, it's a hard race, I did it last year. Uh, different finish. Uh, the parkour is, I would say, more easy this year. But it don't mean that the race is not going to be hard. Uh, I think the race will open up early and then we will see in the final. Uh, so yeah, I, I really look forward. What did you learn in your participation last year about the, the this gravel section themselves? Yeah, uh, the gravel section is it's not so difficult. It's really hard uh, packed, a lot of small stones on it, but in the ground. Uh, so it's, it's really nice and, and it's, uh, it's, it's not so difficult, but of course it will be a really difficult race. How do you feel physically at the start of the season? Uh, yeah, I came directly from uh, altitude camp. Uh, I felt good two days ago. Uh, we did not get the result that we would like. We missed a little bit in, in, the, in the final and, uh, and then I lost my teeth. <laughs> Uh, pl plastic. Uh, so after the race today, I go to the dentist. Uh, luckily, not painful. Um, so yeah, I uh, I feel good, and I hope for a good race here and, and also Roda del Sol. Just one last question: the fact that Tadej Pogacar is there, that will lock the race, or knowing his his usual uh, behavior, that will make a crazy race. Yeah, I, th I think it will be nice. UAE is really strong, and and I think they're here to also race hard. I hope. Uh, that we will have a hard race and I know my former teammate Tim he did it also last year and he know the parkour and he know where you have to push so uh, I, th I think we'll have a nice race today Thank you very much, best of luck Yeah, without a front tooth there Andreas Krohn, so a trip to the uh, dentist for him Well, the race is on in the chase group or in the peloton we see uh, Two riders there for Team Emirates. Ben Chulet is part of the uh, first group as well. Looks like Ben Turner is also the uh, slightly taller rider. Three riders here of uh, Team Emirates. <laughs> Bogacic is really putting the hammer down right now. Yeah, yeah, that, that was kind of set up. They did obviously this was the plan that they wanted to open up the race here. I think it's Hershey's just struggling a little bit. There is a bit of elevation on this uh, gravel section, and but you heard from uh, Cron there that you know it's hard packed, and you know the only thing that you have to worry about is potentially kind of pinch punctures or, or something like that. Um, but it's it's rideable. You can ride it at speeds. And definitely Pogacar is putting a little bit of speed in. Nice to see Tim Wellens. I feel that maybe a couple of days ago that. Tim Wellens looked really, really strong. They came up a little bit short with uh, Matteo Trentin, and maybe if they'd gone with uh, Tim Wellens, they might have got a different result. But this race is exploding now, slightly kind of dragging up here, making it very, very difficult. This gap coming right down, 1 minute 13 to Samitia. He's done his job, but the question is, where is Movistar? They put a ride on the breakaway. We say they want to keep the pressure on the race. I can just about see one in this uh, second group here, but Wellens is here. There's the Carsten Krohn, uh, not Carsten Krohn, I used to race with him. Uh, Andreas, Andreas Krohn. 
Yeah, is there um, for uh, Lotto Destiny, um, Pogaccio, and you know, looks as if this is going to be the the place and the decision where the you know the race winner is is, is in one of these groups just behind. This is where the, the race is really opening up now. Yeah, so we have Pogaccia, we have Wellens, we have Andreas Krohn and the two Bens, Ben Turner, Ben Schulitz, uh, uh, representing uh, the Ineos Grenadiers in that first group. There he is, also a rider there for Anton Machine. It looks like uh, might be Simon Clark as well there for Israel Primitech. Although on these images, you must excuse me, it's pretty hard to discern everybody, anybody there. I just recognise well, Pogaccio by the tufts. Well, I think that's Matt Swartz-Smith that's um, been caught. He was already, Indeed. he went into the section. So I think the Israel Premier Tech rider is there. But Movistar, well, I was talking about, you know, we put a rider in the breakaway, keep the pressure on the race, but there's nobody here. No, they only have that one rider in front. That is the only thing. And in the distance, we have uh, some riders uh, trying to fight back on. But uh, this is crunch time. Lorenzo Rota is the uh, rider there for Entermaché Wanti. So we have a group now of eight riders with Hirschi, Velens, Pogaccia, Ben Turner, Ben Tulit, Lorenzo Rota, Marzwit Schmidt, and Andreas Krohn. Those are the uh, riders uh, chasing this guy whose gap is now dropping uh, rather rapidly as he approaches the end of the sector, although, um, well, he still has one and a half kilometers to go, which can be quite a while if you have to do it uphill. This is um, a sector where the gradients, uh, well, the average gradient to uh, Santa Elalia is 4.6%, uh, but uh, as you can see, he's really struggling, Sergio Samitia. The break went straight from the gun, so he's been on the attack already for 130 kilometers, Brian, and uh, being the strongest in the break, he also likely did a lot of the work in the breakaway to keep it going. Yeah, but he's also um, been told, I think, to press on, to put the pressure on the race and to put the pressure on UAE. But, you know, they've come up fighting. You can just see a little bit of the elevation on here now with Hershey pushing hard. Um, it isn't easy on these sectors. OK, it's hard packed and this is uh, why the riders can get out the saddle here. But this is all about power now. And we have got the powerhouses at the front in this group of eight. really strong group of eight riders here. Some of the, the names that we expected, also some of the names, um, well, we don't have any riders from, from Movistar, like you said. We don't have any riders from Team Covistar. Uh, Covistar? <laughs> Covidis. <laughs> it's like a mix of Team uh, Movistar. And there's the attack by Pogaccio, and the only one who can follow at the moment is Ben Tulit. And it looks like Andreas Krohn is also trying to, to get there. Remember, Ben Chula, he only traveled to the south of uh, Spain from Andorra yesterday to uh, to be a, a late replacement for the team. And he's the only one following Pogaccia, but he's struggling. He's really struggling at the moment. His head, you can actually see that really, really tiny shake of the head there by Ben Chula when uh, Pogaccia was attacking. Well, it looks like uh, Pogaccia has had a good winter of racing and he's on his own. He has attacked. He's 40 seconds now behind our leader Samitier and well it is roughly the same place in terms of kilometers where Lutsenko went last year so who knows uh, Brian we'll see the same uh, scenario again a solo a, a solo victory well we, he said in his interview at the start didn't know how his, his race legs would be but they look absolutely fine now uh, this is probably <laughs> one of the kind of harder sections like you said this is where we came in here last year and it was starting to split up quite considerably um, so the question now is there going to be a bit of a regrouping now and it, I think there will be and this is going to t kind of help but you know with the Ben Tulip with Turner gets up there but at the same time it's going to help uh, Team UE because they've got Wellens and Hershey just behind as well who will get a free ride uh, if they, they hang on to the group in front so yes Amitri is going to be joined by Pogacar very very soon um, but you know yeah that was a a big attack there. It will all really depend on what happens, uh, if there's any cohesion in the chase behind, because uh, I think that it will start to to regroup behind. But UE in a very good spot here with Pogacar in front and with the uh, two other strong riders and Hershey and Wellens just behind. Yeah, he's going to glance over his shoulder, this man from the province of Huesca, and uh, we'll see today Pogacar cycling royalty 
on his way to the uh, lead of this race, the man from Slovenia. Profiting just a little bit from motorbike there as Samitian approaches the end of the sector. It's just uh, over that hill and then the next one actually is not that far. It's only a kilometer or two before we go on to sector number five. But this was actually, Brian, the last steep hill of the race. Uh, of course, we have these steep hills in Strada Bianca as well. In that respect, it's uh, kind of the same race. But from this, we stay on this plateau, which is about 700 meters above sea level. We do have some small hills, but nothing like we have had before. So maybe if they can group together behind Bogaccia, who knows what can happen. But yeah, this man has won Strada Bianca in a similar fashion, actually, racing uh, back to Siena on his own. So. Um, I do wonder if they'll ever see him again before he steps onto that podium and wins the Gilded Olive. Well, that's the thing that, um, you know, he looks strong. Um, he's definitely testing himself out in his first race. Kind of was setting himself up for or the team to be able to do that. But as soon as you get pictures behind, I know that both Ben's and Ines Grenadiers will have a, a hard fight to come back. Um, but the best that best interest of staying together. I think Kron will still be with him, so he'll ride. Uh, Rota, if he's there, but unfortunately for um, everybody else behind, they will have passengers. Wellens, not too sure if Hershey is still there, but UE have got uh, some numbers behind as well. So they'll be getting a kind of free ride. Um, so, yeah, just when I thought that this um, field was a little bit stronger than last year and we wouldn't get someone doing what Lysenko is doing, well, Pogacar has proven us wrong, that he's he's up for doing exactly what Lysenko is doing, and that's trying to go solo. You think it's time to uh, to get out the olive facts already? I prepared. If you want to go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's wait a little bit longer before we, we throw in uh, more interesting facts about fruit and veg, because uh, apparently not everybody enjoyed it yesterday during the uh, Classica, the Almeria. Former winner of that race here in this group, Antonio Jesus Sota. And then uh, the commissaire is uh, actually trying to move to the front here. This man, he's such a special guy. He has so much talent and he just makes it seem so effortless all the time. Of course, that was also one of the attractions last year of that Tour de France stage. We we haven't seen uh, Pogacar in in a lot of trouble in a lot of races, and that was that was one of those days that he was in a lot of trouble. This is a chasing group, 35 seconds, with Ben Turner, with Andreas Kron, Ben Tulit, Lorenzo Rota, Mats Schmidt, and of course the two passengers in that group, Tim Vellens and uh, Mark Hirschi, who are not going to do anything. And, well, Samitjar is just trying to save Movistar's day here and, and try to get the most of it out of it. I'm kind of surprised he's riding as much. Uh, I know Pogaccio has just made a, a big effort to come across to him because they, they did have almost two minutes going on to that section at the peloton behind, but I don't think I'd be overly keen in, in, in working too much. Samitia must know that, you know, he's got a a good wheel to sit on and I would sit it on longer than he's sitting and to be honest with you because you know there's a little bit of firepower behind that I'm not going to say this race is over at the moment that we will have a, a hard chase from from the riders behind but you have to say that UE team Emirates in a, in a really nice position here purely because they've got uh, Hershey and Wellens just behind for plan B or C yeah, there they are. Valence with number 27, Hirschi with number 23. Um, also starting um, sector number six. It's 4.2 kilometers long, running from 39 kilometers to uh, 34.8. It's becoming a uh, rather dusty affair. It's um, it's a flat kind of sector. It doesn't have the gradients we, we just saw on sector number five. But we are uh, approaching by SEP, so we are approaching um, uh, the place where we started, well, it says finish line in my road book, so then it should be obey that, but I think we're returning to Baisa. 
Yeah, this is a little bit of a lost battle here, Brian. It's five against one, <laughs> and the gap's not coming down. And just when we see the group behind, look at the speed that Pogacar is doing here. Uh, of course, we've seen him do this so many times in the past. You know, he's winning um, Strada Bianchi. It's just testament what, what he's doing here. He just has to be careful that, um, you know, he stays upright in some of these corners. But, you know, they're, they're in the, the driving seat at the moment, uh, UE team member. It's purely because they've got uh, two riders just behind. So... You could see that Pogaccio went on to his race radio. He just wanted to know what the, the race situation was, who was where. And he'll be more than happy. He knows he's got two lieutenants a little bit further back, so he can commit totally. He just looks around and asks uh, Samiti if he can help. Samiti has been in the breakaway all day today. I would be doing very, very little. <laughs> um, you just know, it's only 32 seconds. And the fact that it's only 32 seconds means there's no uh, no neutral service car, there's no team car. So if there is a problem now mechanically or a crash for one of the two riders at the front, the team car is now behind the second group. So, yeah, then that gap will be will be done within within no time. Of course, you can see a, a team car of Movis there on the on the left side of the road with some spare wheels. But uh, yeah, with 40 seconds, um, that's about the time you need to uh, to get a new wheel in. So, of course, bad luck can be a factor on these unpaved roads, but we have done most of them. After this sector, we have uh, 13 kilometers left to do. Um, both of them actually uphill and both of them exactly the same because we're now on the local circuit after we cross the finish line. It looks like... Uh, Samitier might be approaching breaking point right now as that woman is also surprised at the speed <laughs> of, of the riders who just passed her. Well, the images are absolutely rather splendid. It's not Tuscany, but it's a lot of olives. This is that third group with the riders of Movistar. This is Oyer Lascano. We saw uh, Gonzalo Serrano as well. And this is indeed that moment of breaking point for Sergio Samitier. Can you blame him after being on the attack for 140 kilometers? He tried to hold on for dear life on the wheel of, of this man, of Tadej Pogacar. But um, there's absolutely no stopping him. This is a furious pace that he's setting. And, um, yeah, I think, uh, I think we need all the facts for the remaining 50 minutes of this race. Well, every time we see Pogacar at the front, it's clearly, I don't know, I don't think it's just, you know, he's in a downhill section and this group uh, are in an uphill section, but he's clearly invisibly travelling faster than the rest. I just don't understand some meteor there. I, for one, and I'll put it straight out there, I would not write, I would not give Pogacar one turn at all. And Samiti did that, and it's cost him. He's, you know, he is, he's kind of struggled by being in that breakaway all day and doesn't have the energy to stay with this man. So if you, you've been caught by Pogacar, who is, who is on a, a good, good day, then you don't want to ride, you don't kind of want to save face. Um, or gave Pogacar a cup. That, that's nice of you to be able to do it. This is racing. You know, he doesn't want to kind of aid this man because in the third group behind, they have got two riders there. This can still come together. This is the what the peloton are calling. Um, so there is still opportunities for Movistar, but I think um, Samiti is just going to go backwards. But 52 seconds, whoa, he's disappearing in, in, the, in this dust. Well, let's just take a moment of uh, enjoying this uh, rather wonderful scenery here. The uh, Sierra Nevada are not that far from where we are, actually. It was one of the preferred um, altitude camp locations for many riders. This group with uh, Rick Schmidt, Andreas Krohn, Lorenzo Rota, Ben Turner and Ben Schillitz. Tim Bellens, the runner-up last year, and Mark Hirschi. We don't know how far back that third group is and if they are um, a threat, but he has just passed that sixth section of gravel. 
meaning uh, he's on his way to number seven, um, or if you're counting down, to number two. Um, and that runs from 25 kilometers to go to 18 and a half. That's 6.5 kilometers long. It's the same one that we are going to do for sector number eight as well, because we are approaching the finish line for a local circuit. Yeah, the two Bens, they, they, they try everything within their might to um, to get back to the front, Brian, but it's it's very hard. It, it seems like they are the only two doing some work there. Well, I think all, all five are, are riding a little bit, but the, there is a, a difference in who's got the power and who hasn't. They've got, it's going to come to a stage where NAS will have to make a, a choice, purely because Wellens and Hershey sitting on, potentially... This is a 1-2-3 for UAE Team Emirates written all over it at the moment. So do you continue to, to ride um, if this gap keeps on going up? You know, you know, you could be throwing the chance away of getting on the podium. So this is where a sports director will have to think about this, whether they continue to ride and dragging the two UAE riders with them, or is it a case of start to think of a podium place? Here we are in the streets of Baesa. The first uh, Finnish passage will be at 31.6, and then we go on to that 15.7 uh, loop. This is Lorenzo Rota, the Italian on the Intermarché. Circus, a one team, who have uh, a little bit of a mixed team here with some of their development team riders and uh, some of their world tour team riders. Well, actually, only Yellow for Motor is from the development team. The rest of them are going on to the Ruta del Sol that starts on Wednesday. A race that you can watch here on Eurosport, Discovery Plus and GCN Plus, alongside the uh, Tour of the Algarve and on this weekend also a three-day stage race in France, the Tour des Alpes Maritimes et du Var. So triple stage racing coming up. Um, and we also have the eSports World Championship on the Glasgow course, on Swift, the new course that's just uh, recently been revealed. Um, Three events, a little bit of a new concept this year for the uh, eSports World Championships. But you can watch that also live here on our digital platforms with uh, Matt Stevens as your host. So a lot of racing coming up this weekend. We have cyclocross uh, also on the weekend. So um, a lot of great fun stuff for you to enjoy. It's the last weekend of cyclocross, by the way, if I'm correct. 47 seconds, oh well, going up to 51 the minute I say it. Um, but it looks like a status quo at the moment, Ryan. What does it tell you? Well, they have to keep on riding behind at this moment. Um, but I think as we get closer to the uh, 20 kilometers to go, you, you have to kind of start thinking what you're going to get out this race. If they don't close this down within the next kind of 10, 12 kilometers, I think. Um, you know, having those two passengers who are going to take huge benefits. Samiti is just about to be caught. I don't think he will add anything to the to the fire at the front to to keep or keep these um, riders rolling through. So it's a hard situation. If you you went if you couldn't go with the Pogacar, then you're going to have to chase him. And he looks as if he's on a really, really good day. But the longer they try and keep it in, they're just hoping that potentially Pogacar starts to weaken. He isn't for the time being. He's holding this. Um, but let this fight commence for a, a, you know continue for a, another like kind of 10, 12 kilometres and then see what uh, what develops. It's crossed the finish line. The chasing group are about to pick up Sergio Sergio Samitier, and then he continues for this local lap on the cobbles. Tadej Pogacar. He's only got one goal on his mind this year, and that is taking back the crown in the Tour de France, taking back that yellow jersey. It's a fantastic town, this uh, Baisa. Like I explained before, these uh, two towns, they're actually quite close together. We'll be there where we started, and Baisa, where we uh, have our finish. They profited enormously from the fact that um, 
they had a, a, quite a few high-ranked officials in the Holy Roman Empire um, and within the Catholic Church coming from this area. They were residing at the court in El Escorial in, um, near Madrid where the uh, um, Spanish king resides. So that's early 1500s with Charles V and his uh, successor, Philip II. And the fact that these guys were, were holding pretty important um, roles at the court, one of them actually being the Secretary of State, also meant that a lot of money flew back to, to the regions where they came from. Uh, patronage is pretty important in the uh, late Middle Ages, early Renaissance times. This, this group um, I mean, is it's not that far back with uh, Bargil, amongst others uh, in this group, some riders of Team Movistar, we also have uh, a few of uh, Antarmashi in that group. Do they, can they still get back to that chasing group, do you think? I think it's only about uh, maybe 30 seconds to the, the chasing group in front. Um, and I think that potentially with the Archaea starting to ride there, then, you know, it's very possible that, uh, you know, they can come back. So I think, you know, that's changing all the time. This man is just content and just doing a time trial for the last 30 kilometers but with the gap coming down behind when the uh, the uh, the group comes back together will there be more riders willing to to ride um if you want to win the race that's that's going to be the, the case that you can't kind of sit back when you've got Pogaccia doing what he does um to be able to chase them so there'll be a lot of questions what do they do is it was there any any grenadiers just behind is it worth kind of waiting for more firepower to be able to, to ride to ride this man down? It's still only about one minute, and I think back to the uh, the peloton, it's only you know within a minute and a half, so it's doable. But um, yeah, Pogaccia is absolutely flying today. It's going to be very difficult to catch him. So Michel is. Um trying to find a place in this group but he's been on the attack for 140 kilometers this is the second chasing groups here on the outskirts of uh, of Baeda a town uh, not that far from one of my well it's, it's a fantastic name for a river the Quadalquivir it's about three kilometers from here as Pogacar continues towards the next sector that comes four kilometers from where we are now Looked like a little bit of a confusing situation there. But um, it looked like he, he was sent the wrong way, but that could be me. We do know that the team car has been sent up right now, which is, of course, a huge relief if he has a mechanical. Because the gap is a minute, meaning the commissaires have, um, have granted permission to uh, Andres Hauptmann, the sports director here of Team Emirates, to, uh, to move to the front. This is that uh, second group, that second chasing group led by uh, Arkea Samsik. We do know that Varan Bargil is in this group. They had one rider in the breakaway today, Matisse Lebert. But we have no indication of how far back uh, that group is with respect to this one. The fact that Arkea Samsik are now losing one of their guys at the front of this group doesn't really bode well. Although the speed is considerable. This is that chasing group. We do know that uh, Brandon Rivera is still there for the Ineos Grenadiers. Work done by uh, Matisse Louvel here with 144. We also had uh, Simon Guelmi doing some work there. But it looks like Arkea Samsik are now gone from the front of that uh, second group, Brian. Yeah, they put a big effort in there, and <clears throat> sometimes when you're trying to kind of close that gap uh, quickly, um, you know, they paid for it. But Movistar starting to get involved with the chase as well. Um, do you have to really question why Samitia gave Pogacar any help whatsoever? But, you know, Pogacar's on his own. This is the chase group. <clears throat> Five riders with, uh, oh, six riders with a couple of passengers. Um, but I'm saying that there's another passenger in Samitia because he's not going to ride because um, he's back in that 
group just behind um, the Jason Pagaccia um, with uh, Movistar trying to ride and obviously Arkea Samsic but it's still holding within a minute it's still doable can't see any weakness in, the, in this man yet so let's see how they play their cards uh, as we get closer to the, this next section of gravel He's not only busy racing his bike, this uh, Tadej Pogacar, together with his fiance Urska Sigart, they also have a charity. Like I said, uh, Tadej Pogacar is not only busy with uh, racing his bike and winning a, ho a whole lot of bike races, um, he and his fiance Urska Sigart also have a charity um, to get money um, in the fight against breast cancer. Um, his mother-in-law, so Ushka's mother, sadly succumbed to, uh, to breast cancer last year. And he also has a, a development team called Pogi's Team, um, with riders like uh, Fabio and Jan Christen, the uh, 2022 Cyclocross World Champion, uh, being part of that team. So he's, uh, he's quite busy. They also have launched a clothing line, um, the uh, Pogi, Pogi Wear, something like that. So um, it's, it's a pretty, pretty busy life. Well, pretty busy life for this man. As he almost hit that guy. Yeah, this is uh, Samitjev from our original breakaway. He's just sitting on. He hasn't got anything left to actually contribute to the work here. Irshi and Velens, of course, they're not doing anything as well because they have their team leader at the front. So Velens, after... 10 years with Lotto, Sudal, Lotto Destiny, he um, he announced that he was going to leave the team all on good terms, but he needed fresh grounds, he needed a new place to develop, and uh, to the surprise of many, he announced that he would sign with Team Emirates. And uh, so far, so good for Tim Valens, uh, the man who lives in Monaco, because he has contributed to the team, but he hasn't won, Brian, his traditional race on Mallorca this year. Although no, it rained was, enough. Yeah, he was there. <laughs> maybe never, never had the form, but, you know, what are his goals for this year with a new team? Is it about, you know, winning races in Mallorca, going well at the start of the year, or is it, you know, further down the line, um, you know, other, other goals? But he seems to be on good form, maybe not the same form that, you know, saw him win uh, other races at the start of the year in the past, but Bugatcher is holding. Normally, when you come onto a big wide road like this and you can see him, then it, it gives you a little bit of, um, you know, motivation, but it's going to be very hard to bring this uh, Soul Rider back of Pugacar, and it really depends on the, uh, the third group in the roads. If this is the first group, second group of the chasers with the, the two bends in it for any screen ideas, it's, it's where is the chase coming from behind? We saw that Arkea were trying, Movistar were trying, but is there anybody else? And this man here is not slowing down one bit. Now, he tries to take the road with the least amount of gravel to make it a little bit more uh, of a smooth ride as, as far as that's possible. This is sector seven. It's the same as sector eight because we're doing that local lap. It's six and a half kilometers long uh, it does have some gradient but um, that comes in the latter uh, half of the uh, of the set of the sector actually uh, the last one and a half kilometers averaging around six percent so we yeah, are judging from the attack that Pogacar just did on the well one of the steeper part of the course I don't see him in any kinds of trouble the only thing holding him back at the moment is mechanical failure they have switched components this year, if I'm correct, um, at the Team Emirates. I think they're on Shimano for the first time. But so far, so good. Two wins already for the team last month in the Tour Down Under with Jay Vine winning that Tour Down Under. I don't think it counts as a spoiler, uh, Ryan, if it's a month later, is it? You never know. A lot of people <laughs> want to kind of catch up. Well, I'm still catch up, catching up on press releases from January, but that's just me procrastinating. It still says Luke Rowe in this group, but it's absolutely not the man from Wales. It's uh, Ben Chulet and Ben Turner. 
for the Ineos Grenadiers. And for me, Brian, the fact that Samitian is still part of this group also indicates that um, the pace is not super high. Let's see when we start to rise up. But, you know, when you see the, the difference between Pogacar here and the chasing group, he's... He's not holding back at all. And he's in a nice place because he knows he's got Hershey and, and Wellens. The interest for me is where is this other group, uh, the group of uh, Warren Barguil? Um, where are they at the moment? Um, because we've so seen nothing of them. But when this man went, you had to kind of go with him. Ben Tulip was the last person on his wheel, just couldn't quite get there. He wanted to go alone, and Pagaccia is just, you know, churning the uh, the watts out at the moment, and he's he's going to be very difficult to, to be brought back. And you know, we're getting close to the point when we come off this sector. The the challenge now is, and it all depends on where this group is behind. What do Ennis do here? Do they continue to to work hard, and then they get mugged at the end by both Hershey and Wellens? Um, or did they start thinking about, you know, getting it and making sure they get on the podium? And this is, as you can see, that steepest part of the sector. One minute, six seconds at the moment. Team car's there, Commissaire car is there for Pogaccia. Brian, he said, I don't know how the race legs are. And with all the science that we have nowadays, how can that still be a thing after all the training? They must know that they are in a certain place physically. What is that that's magic lot, of race legs? That's why a lot of the time I, I don't see the point in um, interviewing someone before the race. <clears throat> What's your plan <laughs> in the race? I'm not going to tell you. They, they, they won't give anything away. So uh, sometimes, you know, when you hear people talking at the start, what, what is the point in, in that interview? Because you know, they've been trained and they know that they can't give anything at all away. I do think that Pogaccia does a little bit of um, cyclocross in his day. I, I did see some images from Slovenia where he was uh, hopping some barriers. But yeah, this is that steep part. This is not looking effortless. But uh, can you blame him? No, he's, he's definitely trying. You have to. It's you know you you've got five riders chasing you from behind, and you know those five riders aren't aren't slouches. Um, but this gap is extended. I'm just looking with the amount of cars behind here. I do not think that or what we're going to call them the the peloton or the Bargill group are, are not going to make it up here. So Metia, I think you know his days days are numbered in this uh, group, and I think as we get over the top of this climb, if if it goes up to Closer to a minute and a half, I think um, it really depends on, you know, who's going to get on the podium. But for the moment, it could be a clean sweep by uh, UAE team Emirates. Um, and if you want to get on the podium, you have to kind of think about this. I know I say it all the time, go for the win. But when you've got somebody this strong, then, and if you want to get onto the podium, you have to really kind of think about your tactics in the last 20 kilometres. Ben Tulip doing all the work at the front. The uh, former cyclocross world champion twice in the junior category. Only one guy did that, and that was um, well, somebody you might know, much of on the pool. Very strong rider, Ben Tulip. Moved to Andorra over the winter time to um, get to live there with. Um, Quite a few of his teammates, Seniors, have a little bit of a race hub there as well, some support. Um, these are still young guys, actually. Uh, Michael Leonard is one of the guys living in Andorra as well. So it's always good to see uh, a little bit of support. And Ineos have, they have a complete overhaul, actually, uh, with a lot of young guys um, in their ranks growing into, uh, well, hopefully for them, the Grand Tour winners of the future. The next step for the likes of Ben Chulet is actually to win um, a stage race of a week long. Last year, fantastic debut in the uh, in the Giro with uh, some spectacular results in the opening time trial, but also after 21 days in that final time trial, still having a top five or top six results is, is huge for such a young guy in his very first Grand Tour. So that is, of course, what he's aiming for to be a Grand Tour candidate. But 
Before that, you first have to do the week-long stage faces, uh, Brian. Although Pogaccia just went from from nothing to Grand Tours, but like it's nothing. He did a few week-long races in between as well. Twenty-one kilometers to go, meaning that the end of this sector is uh, three and a half kilometers away for Pogaccia. He's halfway. 127 at the moment and yeah the organizers of course they were absolutely thrilled when the rumors <laughs> camera bike hitting a branch there when the rumors appeared that uh, that that Pogaccia would start his season here and of course for a small race like this brian hearing that one of the biggest stars of the world is is in your race that that is that is extra extra sangria for everybody and some olive oil as well this was a, a, a new race this year, uh, went down well and it was always going to build from strength to strength. You know we've got a gravel race in um, Strada Bianchi in Italy, one here now. Um, and it's, you know, gravel is absolutely booming now. Uh, I'm involved with the, the hot chilli event down at the, uh, the Akoi Stone Circle around Stonehenge, uh, summer solstice on the 24th of June and, you know, the, the entries are coming in thick and fast and, you know, we, we're going to limit it this year. but. You know, gravel is, is growing. I'm talking to a lot of, um, you know, people within the cycle industry over here in the UK, and all they seem to be talking about is, is gravel. And, you know, it's got a good balance between male and female as well. Um, they did the LTP last year and did a balance about 60 40, um, which is, I think, is great. So nice, it yeah. is attracting a lot of kind of youngsters, hipsters, um, <laughs> you know, possibly people with beards and tartan shirts and things like that to, to ride to Like, gravel like yourself, Brian. So yeah, hipster, uh, well, so beard. It's it's absolutely 100% you. Yeah, I don't know about the tartan <laughs> shirts yet, but um, <laughs> yeah, they may come. And the great thing about gravel, um, I hosted a panel discussion last month and there was a rider from Kenya, Nancy Kidebe, and she said the great thing, she's, she's part of a, a fantastic team called Team Amani, she said the great thing about gravel is that everybody can just enter it. And that is great for, for riders, for example, from Africa. You don't have to be scouted by a UCI team. You need a bike, you need to, uh, you need to race, and you can race, which makes the entry level for, for riders from Africa a lot lower, is what she said. And I think that's absolutely marvelous because um, one of the things that she told me was it's absolutely great that we have the world championships in rwanda in two years time but it doesn't really do a whole lot for the african riders because the entire circus of the world championships travels to africa for two weeks and then goes back home it means that for female riders like herself there's still a whole road to go before they get picked up by a uci road team there's the problem with the visas there's no scouts uh, scouting in African races, well, n not as much still. And gravel is a fantastic way for these riders to, uh, yeah, to, to race and to, to get on the radar as well. And especially the low, low level, well, the low entry level. You don't need to be on a UCI team per se to to be able to race gravel. Is what really attracts uh, a lot of people to it. So it's uh, it's it's really good for diversity and equality as well. The gravel scene. We have got the World Championships in Scotland. Um, I can remember as a young lad uh, being inspired watching Sean Kelly in a green jersey race around Glasgow city centre. We, we didn't get that too often, seeing Robert Miller as well in a polka dot jersey. You don't get to see that. I think the inspire is the word. The World Championships being in Rwanda hopefully will inspire youngsters to look at cycling as a chance um, to maybe, you know, kind of better themselves, um, go further afield and, you know, the bike is a, not just a, you know, a mode of transport. So I think that it's it's big that is there. I've dealt with, you know, an African team. I, I know the challenges they've got with visas um, and um, different kind of cultures as well. But I really do think that you know, it will inspire many, many riders from Africa. Uh, and I hope that does happen and, and we'll see them. Because, you know, let's be honest here, the, the, 20, the 2012 um, Olympics in the UK here in London was huge for that. It inspired mm -hmm. a lot of people, male and female, to look at cycling. And, 
you know, when you look at the, the success we're getting on the track, the youngsters coming through on the road, we see two bends here. It's been a, a great inspirational tool. Yeah, absolutely, most definitely. We, we did have the African Championships um, to date, and that was won by um, Henok Mulaberan, a rider of the green team by, by Diani. And for the women's race, it was actually a rider from Nigeria. Uh, quite an unexpected result, because it was from a breakaway. But she won that, road, uh, that race, Ese Lovina Uch Peserayev. Um, doing the Tour of Rwanda again from, uh, from next Sunday. And the great thing about that is is the enthusiasm from the people over there on the side of the road so i am looking forward to the 2025 world championships and i do just like you brian hope that there's a lot of inspiration coming from it because it's just impossible that the entire continent of africa only has one rider like biniam grimai there must be so many more we're only just waiting to uh, to find them and to give them a chance and to make just it just so much easier for them to actually race um, in Europe and be in races like this one well our chasing group uh, are losing time on uh, on Pogaccia as he approaches the finish line again the next time we cross the finish line is in a kilometer so this is that last kilometer in the absolutely stunning town of Baisa we're probably going to see some uh, some images of all the Renaissance architecture that we have here but um, I think it's a race for seconds. Um, you don't have to be a cycling connoisseur to, uh, to state that. It was 42 kilometers out from the finish line when Tadej Pogaccia launched a rather scathing attack. Uh, the only one who could fit, follow for, well, one and a half minutes was actually Andreas Kron and Ben Schulitz, and then it was uh, over and out. Race day number one, and it looks like race win number one as well for Pogaccia, and imagine, uh, for the people there on the side of the road seeing this guy in action. It really is uh, absolutely grand. And most important thing, he gets a gilded olive, Brian. The gilded olive is the price here. Everybody wants I, that. I don't know if he's thinking about that at the moment. <laughs> he's just taking everything in. He's made a big effort, but like you say, the um, speed of the chase has gone out a little bit now. They just took a moment there just to go back to the team car. I think it's now that they're starting to think we're not going to catch Pogaccio. I think as soon as it went over a minute and a half, they're not going to catch. They've got enough time in front of the next group behind. It is now the opportunity of uh, looking at the podium. If you've come here uh, to win the race, then you know that opportunity is gone now. And even with a puncture or anything like that, I still think that uh, Pogac has got enough time. Um, but now there's less of a chase and it's all about, you know, who's going to finish on the podium. Of course, you're going to think that Hershey and Wellens are in the prime place for that. But by not kind of knocking your pan in at the front chasing Pogac, just taking that little bit more time to, to try and recover because... If you want to finish on the podium here, then you've got an opportunity to do that. If you keep on riding at the front, then I would say it would be a clean sweep for UAE team Emirates. So it does look as if that easing now means that we're going to have a bit of a, a fight um, for the uh, second and third places. Look at the uh, views there as Pogaccia takes in uh, a last gel, 15k out from the finish line on the cobbles here on the outskirts of Baisa. Absolutely wonderful weather, about 15 degrees Celsius, which is uh, 60 Fahrenheit for those of you uh, watching in America, for example. Ben Turner, he tries and he tried, but um, it's a little bit of a lost battle. We have Matsubut Schmitz, Ben Tulit, Andreas Krohn, Lorenzo Rota, Tim Berns, Mark Hirschi and Sergio Samitia, the man from the original breakaway of the day still at the front this is the chase group we haven't seen an image yet of group number two but uh, the fact that uh, Arkea Samsic had two riders at the front with uh, Matisse Louvel and Simon Guelmi doing the work and uh, the one shot that we got from that group was the moment that both Louvel and Guelmi uh, uh, got dropped from that group also kind of sealed the face for that group uh, in second or actually third position.
Team Emirates were the power team here with Shoot Box, Alessandro Kovi, Mark Hirschi, Bogacar, Matteo Trentin, and Tim Valens, and they absolutely delivered as well. Looks like we have one snack left, one gel left. And taking it back in his rear pocket, as we all should be doing. This is the peloton. With Guillaume Martin, they're their last position. In front. Yeah, they're, they're not that far off. Indeed, the team cars following that group now have to wait on the outskirts here of the town, where the old ramparts were, the old city walls. And this region, Chaen, is absolutely uh, chock full of olive trees, which um, are also quite picky. Is, um, they also need everything to be exactly right to grow and to give fruit because it, it's not absolutely a given that an olive tree gives fruit. It takes at least five years before they have uh, olives and then um, it depends on how warm it is, how much moisture, how little moisture, if they're in the full sunshine, if they're not. So quite a picky tree. Um, but if you plant just thousands and thousands like they do here, in the south uh, east of, uh, of Spain, there's always enough to uh, to go by. Like I said, 90% of it ends up in olive oil, and you've like so much gradients of quality in olive oil. Some is absolute rubbish, and some is very expensive and absolutely top quality. And if you just have uh, a little bit of salad, a little bit of olive oil, and some lovely sea salt, well, I'm happy. Olive oil is always on the table for the teams as well. It's always in the uh, boxes. And in Spain, um, Brian, you know that more than I do. You're a world traveler. There's a lot of olive uh, oil also with breakfast. We do chocolate sprinkles. The Spanish do olive oil. For breakfast? Chocolate sprinkles, yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm just porridge myself. <laughs> it's just so, just so normal. No, no, chocolate sprinkles. Twelve kilometers in an absolute dream scenario for the organizers of this race. The Clásica Jaén Pariso Interior, Sea of Olives, Mar de Olivos. A race organized by the Spanish national coach, Montpaler. They did have... Um, Quite a sad weekend, actually, because uh, one of their motorbike pilots, uh, Mr. Jose Carlos Perez Garcia, uh, died of a heart attack on his way to this race Saturday. And there was a minute of silence before the start for him, as there was for Estela Dominguez, the uh, young Spanish rider, uh, the daughter of Juan Carlos Dominguez. I think that's a rider from your era, Ryan. Um, and he, she sadly died in a, in a, in a car-related accident um, on the weekend so there was a minute of silence before the start for these two people before we started racing and there indeed in the distance we can see that second group coming back and that means more candidates for the top two and top three positions it's this is the i think the the most exciting part now is the the race for the podium now because you've got this group that's been out front they started kind of knocking it back I just thought with the amount of uh, cars behind, they must have been well up, but no, I think, you know, having the, the amount of cars behind has helped this group come back um, to the second group. So we could see a merging. Have they got anything left? That's the thing. This man has got something left, but we still got quite a difficult section uh, to go, come before the finish. And I think the second group are, are, are trying to get a save a little bit of energy for that. So it might be a case of they might get caught by the third group in the roads uh, and still the podium positions will be fought out by, um, you know, a couple of riders in this uh, group here. Andreas Krohn in the uh, interview before the start, we could see that he lost a tooth. Uh, his little gap there. Um, he's off to the dentist to get a new uh, implant will take a little bit of time of course uh, implants don't come ready mate but, 
uh, it will be fixed and his smile will be restored. Let's see what's going to happen in group two. Are they actually just going to sprint for it? Or is there going to be a little bit of an attack on that final uh, sector of gravel that is coming up uh, for him in one kilometer time? that the group behind them is approaching although <laughs> these riders are now racing again Ben Turner the man who won the race on Saturday and from uh, the north of England Andreas Krohn here in the colors of Lotto Destiny fantastic start to the season for them as well of course uh, thanks to Arnaud de Lille they uh, have a pretty big spring season coming up and uh, in Belgium they're always the little team compared to uh, Patrick de Fevre's uh, Sudal Quickstep team. There was a little bit of a, a game of uh, magical chairs there between uh, all the three or four World Tour teams in Belgium. With some sponsor swapping going on, uh, Sudal went to Quickstep, de Koning went to uh, Alpecin de Koning, and then um, Destiny, a phone provider, went to uh, Lotto Destiny. But they're always the smaller team, but with the likes of Arnaud de Lille, possibly Pascal Inkhorn, well, let's see what happens uh, opening weekend. That is one week from Saturday. Omloop at Nieuwsblad, Kuhne, Brussel, Kuhne. And for De Leap, it was actually Kuhne that was his big target. But after his rather splendid display in Etoile de Bessage, especially with uphill efforts, well, he added Omloop at Nieuwsblad and skipped the Samang, the Tuesday race, from his schedule. 20 seconds, Brian. It looks like uh, they don't want to get, they don't want that second group coming back. No, they're having to try a little bit hard on this group now because, like you said, they don't want them to, to come back. I think they'll hit this uh, final sector uh, with a, you know, bits. It's what anyone's got left. The, the stronger riders are out the front already. You know, the, the hardest part of the race was when this man went on the attack, and if you weren't there then, um, you know, you're kind of playing catch up. So I, I do think that the favourites for the, the other places on the podium, second and third, are, are from the second group. But it does look as if this uh, third group are going to, going to get very, very close. Questionable tactics here from, from Movistar. I know they've got some idea here, but <laughs> why on earth would would you give Pogacar any turn whatsoever? He did. Um, and now, he's chased, uh, now his team are, are forced to kind of chase in the third group. Yeah, Movistar and tactics, it's, it's not the first thing that we heard from it. And it's probably also not the last thing. It's a little bit of a running gag as well. And, and I think it's not really kind on them. Oops. Oh, we have a problem. We have a problem. Of course, he has one and a half minutes on uh, the chasing group. But this is, of course, what we feared. Looks like uh, Pogaccia is on 30s there, um, judging from the uh, width of the tyre. This was a pretty strong uh, change, of course, the... Uh, bike would be front right for Pogaccia, so when the mechanic jumps out of the car, uh, European cars that is, um, that's actually the first bike that he can grab, and this must have cost him no more than 30 seconds, Brian. Yeah, no more than that, he did a, a double push there. Um, so I even said at the time, even a, a puncture and anything like that's not going to stop him from winning this race. It might actually give him a little bit of a rest, but... Um, just unfortunately, uh, looked like he, he got a puncture there. Quick change and, and off he went. No stress whatsoever. A little bit of communication there. Looks like a, a flat front tyre for him. Mechanic jumping out of the car, taking the front, front right bike, which is usually the bike for the... Uh, team captain front right or rear right and always a full bike set up for the team leader also on the team car yeah, it's well this is now. a group this is a group coming back now we see some i guess something there must be uh, uh Bargil. we have the, i think the dutch champion is there pascal inkhorn some movie star riders with uh, Lascano being one of them and I think also the winner of the Tour of Britain Gonzalo Serrano is uh, is in that group 
but they are together. 120 is the gap now, seven kilometers to go. Still four kilometers of gravel to go for Tadej Pogacar. Of course, they have heard through the communication that there was a little bit of a technical problem for the race leader. But um, yeah, he's back on his bike, he's powering on. He even had the clear thought to take his, I don't know what bike computer they use, but his uh, head unit there and powering on. He doesn't have a bottle anymore, but for the final seven kilometers, you don't need a bottle. I don't think he's what he worried about anything. It was nice and it relaxed it. I really want to see the, the challenge behind um, for the uh, the last places. I think Ben Turner has left a lot on, on the roads. Uh, now we're starting to see more and more riders thinking about these podium positions. Matteo Trenton over on the right-hand side. Uh, Tim Wellen still still within sight, but you know, Ineos Grenadiers and uh, UE trying to push. Matteo Trenton is just going back a little bit now, so he is a bit of spent. Uh, Tim Wellens has to be right up there as one of the favourites. Um, OK, he's got Pogaccio in front, but, you know, he, he could be uh, trying to finish second again in this, this race. <laughs> uh, I think that's what he'll be thinking of it. This is where we'll see the action in the uh, the group behind as they start to, to battle it out for the, the minor positions now. Absolutely no olive for the runner-up. That's, um, that's a fact. He can, he can have, well, two more mechanicals um, and then, well, possibly still win the sprint. Um, but, yeah, this is uh, still looking very, very strong. The steepest part is uh, this kilometre. It's about 6% for Tadej Pogacar. Most difficult sector here. Lovely to see uh, people out on the road cheering him on. And there is the chasing group with Ben Turner. And riders coming from the background to try and uh, get a little bit closer. Such grand form for this man, uh, Brian. He's already showed that he's got some good form. Uh, Tim Wellen's going with him now. So, you know, these are the two strongest teams in the race. Andres Kron just can't get there. Hinter is trying as well. So, just look as if that kind of moment of relaxation from the second group has given. Ben Turner enough left in his legs to try and kind of chase the uh, one of the podium positions because I still think that Tim Wellens is in the kind of box seat to to finish in second here. It's exactly the expressions the Belgians use as well, being um, in a seat, being in a sofa, actually uh, towards the front. Tim Wellens uh, was the man who did that final lead out also on Saturday which uh, completely destroyed that first group in Murcia. So his form is absolutely great and, um, yeah, in a uh, prime position to be second yet again for this year behind his teammates uh, today, Pogaccio. Ben Turner and Tim Bellens are the two chasers. I'm absolutely uh, looking forward to see what this man can do in the Spring Classics. He can actually win Perry roubaix I could see it happen last year, of course, already a win for Ineos in that emblematic classic for Dylan von Barlet. He switched teams. He's now a Jumbo Visma rider, but Ben Turner could take that place. One minute and five seconds is the gap for today Pogacar on Ben Turner. And Tim Bellens, only five kilometers to go, just two and a half kilometers of gravel left for our race leader. Uh, the gap is is going to be too big to, to bridge in, um, in these final five kilometers. But if another mechanical happens, and, and I hope it does not, uh, then we'll have a totally different situation. But for now, Tadej Pogacar is just powering on there, the man from Slovenia. And he has done the most difficult part of the sector. For Mirhon, it's... Um, well, most of it is a downhill stretch towards the finish line, although we do have a little bit of elevation left in the streets of Baesa. Two chasers where Valence is uh, is taking over, Brian. 
Or is this yeah, just I was just about to show? say that. The, the question <laughs> now is, do you want to secure two uh, places in the podium? And, and that's your answer there. It was always going to be very close behind. And, you know, it's always in the mind. You know, Pogacar's won this. He's over a minute in front. Do you really want to, to finish uh, on the podium? Tim Wellens is, you know, wants to, and that's why he's helping uh, Ben Turner here. So it was just a case of, you know, the, the group behind uh, were very, very close. And, and so why not? Why not right? You're not going to catch Pogacar in front. So this is good tactics here from uh, UAE team Emirates because they want to have two riders on the, on the podium at the end. Of course, uh, a team like uh, like Emirates don't have to worry about points and the renewal of the World Tour licenses. Uh, winning a Tour de France will get you about I think about a thousand points, at least, with some stage wins and days in the yellow jersey, etc. So it's it's not an absolute must to have two riders on the podium, but it's a nice thing to have. But for Pogaccia, it means first race day of the year, first win. He hasn't done that before. Um, He's been there, thereabouts, second, third, fourth race day in recent years. The winning on the first day, that's a new one for him, and it will make him happy. This is personal for Tim Wellens. I know it's, you know, it's not the ultimate um, goal to, to finish two riders on the podium or three, um, but when you've worked hard for the team and, you know, looking at back at the races we've covered over the last couple of days, Tim Wellens has, has worked hard. So for, you know, that kind of personal touch, I think it's nice that encouraging him to ride because he'll get on the podium and okay you know being on the podium um everybody wants to win but at the same time they realize that this man is just stronger than anybody else and it's nice for tim wellens to get himself on that podium he was on it last year and to do it again it's just a nice feeling that having you know been on the t been on the, the podium with the winner and the winner just happens to be your teammate Three kilometres left for Tadej Pogacar. Remember the first time he came to prominence that uh, we all had to work very hard on that pronunciation. I think uh, most people have got it nailed. He's, of course, uh, among the top three of best cyclists in the world. Last year, fourth in the Tour of Flanders, and he almost had it. He, he almost had it, actually. It's not that far away from actually winning the Tour of Flanders. The gap is yo-yoing just a little bit there, but uh, a minute is a solid lead, especially since this is mostly downhill all the way back to Baesa, a town of about 16,000 inhabitants. Valens and Turner in pursuit. Two and a half kilometers left to go for this man. And this is that third group, that chasing group with uh, Lorenzo Rota still. He has got a teammate here. Looks like Simamon. It looks like we have our podium together, Brian. Yeah, and that's why Wellens is helping. Um, you know, and, and Turner would take this all day long. That um, you know, if Turner was left to right, then it might not be an option for a podium for for both the teams. So you know, they have to be in acceptance that you know they're well beaten by a stronger rider, but just guarantee the next two podium places. It's almost in the bag for Tadej Pogacar. <laughs> ben Turner, look at the gear that he's turning there. It is a uh, serious gear for the man from Ineos Grenadiers. Really, really pushing very, very hard to get to that second spot. But I do rate Tim Bellens, uh, a, well, the better sprinter of the two. Although, well, we have seen on Saturday what Ben Turner can do. There's a little bit of a smile on his face. The tufts are there, the pogey hair is there, and the first win of the season is imminent. After this, he continues to the Tour of the uh, Tour of Andalusia or Ruta del Sol, which will be uh, on air here on Eurosports Discovery Plus and GCM Plus with Jess Cox and with you, Brian. And uh, this man will be on the start line together with a 
whole lot of superstars and a really, really exciting um, um, course. Always, of course, here in the south of Spain. The weather promises to be good, although we do have a little bit of wind, just like we had on the weekend. But uh, today, Pogaccia is off to a great start of the season already. Before the start, yeah, he was unsure whether the race legs were there. Well, 42 kilometers from the finish line, and we had a pretty steep part in um, in Santo Lalia. That is where he attacked. The only one who could follow were Andreas Kron and Ben Tulit. But after a kilometer or two, these two riders also were dropped from the wheel of today Pogacar, who started a hour-long effort on his own. There was, well, there wasn't even a slight panic. There was a flat tire, there was a bike change. He lost about 30, 35 seconds, but still wins the bike race with a pretty large margin. The smile on his face today, Pogaccia. He is the winner. First day of the season, first race day of the season, first victory for him in the sunshine here in Baesa. Absolutely stellar outcome to this race. The best man won, and the best man today is today, Pogaccia. Bravo to him, also bravo to the fantastic teamwork of Emirates because uh, they set the attack up for this man to complete. Wonderful victory for today, Pogaccia. And then the sprint for second, Brian, between Tim Vellens and Ben Turner. Tim Vellens in first place. That is the best place to start the sprint in this uh, rather tricky final. But the bigger gear of Ben Turner is going to make the difference. Turner is going to sprint to second. What a fantastic three days for him in Spain. He had the fastest climb last week uh, in Etoile in de Bessege in the time trial, already displaying the fantastic form that he is in. But uh, another fantastic result for Ben Turner. But um, yeah, without a doubt, this is the man of the moment. Sprinting for the minor placings. Andreas Krohn is sprinting to place four. We have Hirschi there, Tulit Zimmermann and Lorenzo Rota. And it looks like Hirschi is going to complete that fiesta for Team Emirates. With a fourth place, Krohn, Tulit. Rota and Simmerman across the line now. Fantastic teamwork by uh, by Team Emirates. In that first group, they almost had all of their riders. The only one uh, missing the cut was actually Shuud Bucks, and uh, Doma Novak didn't take the start. So they actually took the race on their shoulders, knowing what this man is capable of. And he was a little bit unsure about the race legs, but, um, well, those legs were there. Well, Brian, another solo win here in uh, Clásica Jaén, Pariso Interior. Um, they changed the course, riding it counterclockwise this time, but uh, the outcome is actually the same, a solo victory. Let's see what happens next year, <laughs> if we do it again. Yeah, I think it will still be a stronger uh, field. Um, I prefer this course. A lot of people saying it was maybe a, a little bit easier than last year. I think there was a, a couple of bits that needed to be taken out the course, and it, I think the organisers have done that. But if you get the legs, there's no place to hide uh, in these type of events. And Pogaccia showed that in his first race of the year that, you know, he's on song. He wants to do well in the early season events, and, and, and why not? Um, but, you know, good ride again for Ben Turner. Tim Wellens was there. I'm glad he got on the podium for the effort he's put in. But, um, yeah, it was a good race uh, by many, many riders. But, you know, there's there's a few teams that walk away from this th thinking that where did it all go wrong? And, and we feel really disappointed. But for Ineos and uh, UAE, it was um, fruitful. There it is, Brian, the trophy that everybody wants, the gilded olive. I think that it goes right into the books as one of the most interesting trophies that the past few days we saw some run-of-the-mill trophies you could buy just in the trophy shop but um, yeah this one is, uh, is something else 
Connor Swift and was uh, fifth last year and up there as well. Last year, the trophy went home to Monaco to Alexei Lutsenko, and now he goes home with uh, Tadej Pogacar. And this is actually the um, olive production facility. One of the many in the region. Looks more terracotta to me. Really? You say so. Well, the colour does. <laughs> Pretty sure it's an olive uh, pressing station. I don't know how you call that. An olivery? But we're going to listen to uh, the interview with Ben Turner, our runner-up to today's race as they uh, prepare Pogacar for the podium ceremony. Let's, uh, let's listen to Ben Turner after his uh, great weekend. Ben, talk to us about that race. That was the hair, but I guess you, with your background, you had some fun there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely had a lot of fun. It was a hard day though, after the last two days of racing. I was really on the limit to be honest, but in the end the legs stayed the same throughout. So, yeah, I was happy, but the last last 10k was really hurting after I attacked. But yeah, I think second one was the best I could do today after Pozzicarl. Yeah, rode away really. What a show really, but yeah. It was when Pogacar was so strong and UAE was also in numbers. How did you manage your, your effort in your chase? Um, so no, really, we just kept the group rolling and, um, yeah, we had to go in the final and, um, yeah, oh, it was hard, it was a hard day, but good, and, uh, yeah, another podium is, uh, it's looking good for the classics, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a betting person, but, um, if I were, well, put some money on Ben Turner for some of the spring classics, but this is the man of the moment, the man of the, um, Jaén Pariso Interior. Tadej Pogacar, a flat tyre, didn't hold him down, well, slowed him down, 30 seconds but a pretty fast bike swap there, no stress, no panic, taking his head unit there for those final 8-9 uh, kilometres, and when that group came back, we did have an attack there from, uh, from Valentin Turner in pursuit of the remaining podium places. But uh, the gap of two minutes minus those 30 seconds for the bike swap proved to be enough for Tadej Pogacar. These riders in pursuit for places number two and three, but the smile on the face there, there he is for Tadej Pogacar. Race day number one, a victory number one. Let's see where we end up at the end of the year. The most important one is going to be the one starting on the 1st of July in the Basque Country. For this man he wants that yellow jersey back he wants to beat Jumbo Visma he wants his third crown in the Tour de France but before that well he's probably going to win a whole lot more starting on Wednesday with Ruta del Sol which is uh, going to be available on our digital platforms and Eurosport with commentary from Jess Cox and Brian Smith Brian that's you uh, hopefully it is yeah there's a few of us <laughs> Yeah, I have that same problem with my name, but that is because my surname is actually a verb. So if you have sentences like, has Jose been to the zoo, you end up with 150,000 hits on, on Google. Just about the same as the amount of Brian Smiths in the world. It's not really a unique name. No relation to Mr. Bean. No, that's, a, that's, a, that's got an A in it, Brian. I do get referred to Mr. Bean quite often in emails because my first name is, of course, um, well, it's actually only in the Netherlands it's a, it's a woman's name. Even down in Belgium, they have a commentator of Belgian television uh, who's a man, Jose de Kauer. So that was, especially at the start of my career, slightly confusing. And whenever I have to book hotels or flights, it's always Mr. Bean. So, ah oh well, such is life. Let's wait for the podium and the handing over of the olive.
Have you ever had like weird podium prices? Um, nothing too weird. I do remember my Foss once winning a frying pan and an office chair. Brad bake machines, stuff like that. <laughs> well, we're waiting for the top 10 of today's race before we leave you. According to my sources, Brian, um, most olive oil in the world is actually consumed in Spain on average 11 litres per person per year. And of course, the olive uh, plays a very important role in the past in mythology. It was actually an olive branch on the Ark of Noach. Uh, when there was land in sight, there is um, olive branches as the sign of peace. And we have a top 10. The uh, time difference is not really correct, but the top 10 should be more or less uh, correct. With Pogaccia, Turner, Velens, Hirschi, Kron, Tulip, Rota, Isagire, Calsoni and Diaz Gallego, I do think that Simabon should be in the top 10. And more slow-mos because everybody loves a smiling Pogaccia. Well, thanks for watching this uh, rather wonderful race in uh, one of the most beautiful parts of Spain. Actually, most of Spain is actually rather wonderful. But this was the second edition of the Classica Jaén Pariso Interior with uh, Tadej Pogacar as the winner with Ben Turner and Tim Villans on the podium. Next race here on Eurosport GCN Plus Discovery Plus on Wednesday, both the Tour of the Algarve and Ruta del Sol, where we will see Pogaccia again. And then, well, it's basically racing every day. So I'll see you soon. And uh, thanks for watching. Well, while we wait for the podium, more olive facts for you uh, to enjoy, Brian. Um, the capital of Greece is, of course, named after Pallas Athens, the Greek goddess. But it was actually um, a battle between two gods, uh, according to mythology, that is. Uh, it was actually Poseidon and Athens, uh, or Athena, uh, vying for the name-giving rights to uh, the capital. and. Zeus, the upper, the chief god, so to say, actually said, well, if you create something that is going to be of use for the people or to be of the most use for the people, I'm going to name this city after you. Well, Poseidon came with a horse. And of course, horse, very useful. But Athens created a olive tree.
And, um, well, in the end, that was the most useful for the people instead of the horse. Well, the thoughts of Zeus are, of course, not mine, but that is how Athens came to be called Athens, with an olive tree. And still on the Acropolis, um, there is an olive tree to remember this historic, albeit not historically correct, fact. Yes, completely useless knowledge. But once you are in the pub quiz, Brian, you will be thankful. You have all sorts of knowledge now about cauliflowers, olives, Greek mythology to really impress your friends. You don't seem convinced. I don't go well, to you're the writing pubs. it down. <laughs> I do expect it. <laughs> you don't go to it now, neither do I. Well, we have an interview coming up with Mark Hirschi. Good day, collectively. I've been really impressive. Today has been impressive. Tell us a bit, take us through the day. Yeah, it was a windy start. And then uh, we tried to control in the first cover sectors. And then, uh, yeah, the plan was before we go to the laps that we open the race and that they go. And, yeah, at the end uh, it was super strong. And me and team, we could just sit uh, at the back in the group. So for us, it was a perfect day. This morning, where we today, it was uh, all to win here. In fact, there was already the idea to win. Uh, if Forty could win already, it's just his first race. Yeah, the, yeah, it was the plan. He, he felt good and he would like to win here. And, uh, yeah, we tried it and uh, it's worked. And for you personally, how did you feel It's the beginning of the season? And did you enjoy this race? Yeah, it was a super nice race. Uh, definitely we'll come back here. Uh, for me, I'm happy with my shape. Uh, good start of the season. I had up good from Australia, from the heat, now back here. And uh, now I go to Algarve today. Perfect. Thank you. And there we have the podium with, uh, well, indeed, Brian, a little bit of terracotta as well. Please hold on to that. It will be slightly embarrassing if you drop the podium price. But um, we have a bottle of olive oil. Of course we do. We have some uh, frizzante. I don't know if this is cava or... And a lot of confusion as well, as every good podium ceremony should have. But it's not the first uh, bottle of fizz that Valence uh, opens, and he is an experienced one. Great technique there. Don't do that with the olive oil, it might get really messy. And just like the uh, Vuelta España, supported by uh, Ecovidro, the uh, sustainability company. And this is the award, olive oil, and a bowl plate thingy. And Ben Turner, next on the podium. Oh, he might get used to this. It's the second time in three days that he's on the podium. First opening the bottle, careful with the olive oil. There was not a lot of shaking action going on there, Ben. Yeah, this is, um, this is somebody's not been on the podium that much, but we do expect the most professional of champagne shaking action going on for Pogaccia. There's the bottle, there's the plate, there's the olive, there's the olive oil, all the spoils for him. What a day. Uh, he's properly impressed with these uh, prizes, as he should be. 
because that Tour de France trophy is absolutely wonderful, but have you ever seen anything like this? If I could ride a bike, I would actually want to win this one. And there it is. <laughs> Let's try again for the glass as uh, most of the podium ceremonies in, front, in Spain here. Well, a lovely podium there. Lovely smiles all around. Tadej Pogaccia, Ben Turner, Tim Bellens is our final podium here in the Clásica Jaén. Paiso, Paiso, Interior. Well, this is uh, the end of the podium ceremony. We don't have the king of the mountains. We have no intermediate sprint. We have no local riders. It's just these three riders on the podium for our second edition of the Classica Jaén. Well, Brian, thanks very much for your company. I hope you learned something. And um, <laughs> look forward to seeing you soon. And uh, we have one final interview coming up with our winner. Yeah, um, to start season like this, it's, uh, it's amazing. Um, first and third place and four. It's, it's amazing teamwork and uh, perfectly played from the UAE team today. So, yeah, I uh, couldn't be more happy. Why attacking so early with 40 kilometers to go? Uh, we had good numbers and we knew that this climb uh, before the final laps was hard. And uh, yeah, we, we decided yesterday after the recon to try here and, and we were in perfect position. I was in the front, two riders in the back, so we were really, really good placed. Even if they catch me, we still have fresh legs in the behind. So yeah, it was a perfect plan. Who is this victory for? Ah, I don't know. Uh, just for everybody to, to finally start the year. Thanks for coming to Jaén and congratulations on an amazing victory. Thank you. Do you enjoy the ambience? Do you enjoy the crowd here in Jaén? Yeah, it was uh, really, really good. It's uh, Monday and still a lot of people on the road, so uh, I'm really happy with the atmosphere. Gracias enorme, el agradecimiento al público, el lunes también que nos haya acompañado también. Tim, on va faire un petit question seulement pour le coureur de, de l'équipe Emirates. Bien, bien sûr, troisième position, super performance aujourd'hui pour l'équipe Emirates. Oui, c'est magnifique, c'est la tactique que Tadej allait attaquer là, donc tout est... Yeah, we had a, a great team tactic here. The, Pugaccio was time, the attack by Pogaccio was timed well. Yeah, this was exactly as we had planned at the team meeting, especially at this, uh, at this place in the course, says Tim Villens. And this is lovely. This is for Estela Dominguez, the uh, rider who sadly lost her life over the weekend, the daughter of uh, former bike rider Juan Carlos Dominguez. And uh, may her family find strength in uh, knowing that the cycling world is thinking of her and will keep thinking of her. A life lost far too soon for Estela Dominguez. Sin lugar a dudas, yo creo que va a pocos eventos en el planeta que en tan solo un año se haya consolidado como esta clásica Jaén Pantín.